What's happening, racing fans? Welcome back to the channel, proudly sponsored by betting.co.uk. So we are well underway now for the jump season and we are back with episode three of the Countdown to Cheltenham series. And we've got a very special episode uh, for you this week because as you can see, we are joined by none other than Gavin Lynch. Gavin, welcome to the channel. How are you doing? Yeah, good, Joe. How are you? Looking forward to Christmas. How are you, Jamie? How are you, Scott? And um, yeah, it's been a very good national hunt season so far. There's been some brilliant weekends. Yeah, so it's good. Just starting to warm up a little bit now, isn't it? I know Scotty's very excited. You had a good weekend at Sandown, Scotty, did you just gone? Yeah, it was good. I was a bit late on the Friday. Flight was late, missed the first two races, but it wasn't the end oh, of the world. No. Got to see some good grade races and uh, Saturday was good fun. So yeah, happy days. And let's roll on the DRF now. That's our next flight abroad, isn't it, Scotty? So we're very much yeah. uh, looking forward to that one. And James, how are you doing, my, my brother? How are you doing? Not too bad, Joe. Thanks for having me. Great to be on with Scott, yourself and... Uh... Kevin Lynch again, so... I've got the legend. It's really, really good. Awesome, awesome. Well, look, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, we are just going to be doing a bit of a run-through through some of the races that we've seen over the last few weeks. Just giving you our brief four thoughts, shall I say. We don't want to go into too much detail with any anti-post today. We just want to have a look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks and see what we think of those races. We're going to start with some of the action that we saw this weekend. Of course, we've had John Bond go on and win at the Tingle Creek from what looked like a bit of a rejuvenated Edward Stone, perhaps. And then, of course, we had Al Fabiolo win the Hilly Way in what actually looked like quite a big weight uh, weight carrying performance as well. Both really good performances, in my opinion. Um, but there's definitely something that has divided some opinion, especially on Twitter over the last few days. Uh, Scotty, you were at Sandown. Uh, talk us through what you thought of John Bond and obviously give us a bit of a comparison with, uh, with Al Fabiolo, would you please? Yeah, I mean, I was with Dave and a few of the other lads, Ian, and um, considering it's like one of the only sports in the world, you can get as close to the superstars as you can before the off. Um, we went and looked at John Bon in the parade ring. He was the last out in the pre-parade ring. And um, yeah, he looked he looked, looked like he didn't want to come out at one point, but he looked the picture, he looked well. Um, and yeah, during the race, he he did what I kind of expected. He jumped pretty solid. Um, it was a bit of a short gap between his last one at Cheltenham in the Schloer two weeks um the ground obviously wasn't ideal for him but he's proven the way he won at the um, november meeting at cheltenham um i don't think it was his best performance uh, we've seen i think he he did the job um there was one point where edward stone was traveling alongside him and he thought he may be in trouble but yeah his class prevailed and he did exactly what i expected him to do um and yeah i think El Fabiola, like we said there, was giving a better weight away in the hilly way to the likes of Mascada. Uh, Phil Dor, who I think's is um, definitely going to improve for a step up and trip later in the season. I think he's definitely got big racing him over two and a half, maybe even further. But yeah, I, I think out of the two, I don't think we learned a lot. Of, El Fabiola's got four legs. He jumped well, um, pretty well. He's pretty keen, I think, at the early part of the race and the quicker they went. Um, he obviously uh, put the gun to the head, Paul Town, and then he jumps like El Fabioli does. He's pretty solid, sometimes gets a bit close into a fence, gallops into one. But out of the two, my opinion hasn't changed. I've still been in the El Fabioli camp, but bigger tests await. And um, I'll be looking forward to see what turns up in the Clarence House in January. Yeah, just to mention, I think it was a big performance there from Phil Dore as well. I think a really good effort from Gordo. I know his horses are absolutely flying at the moment, but he ran a mighty race as well, didn't he? He did. Um, Gab, what did you think of John Bond this weekend? For me, it definitely takes them a little bit more effort to jump in this sort of deep ground. So I wouldn't be as critical as most to think about John Bond's performance this weekend. What what were your thoughts on uh, on how he got on? I thought he was very good. Um, no complaints. Um, when you look at Edward Stone, I think his record going right-handed might have been five from five before the weekend, apart okay. from the unseat uh, at Christmas. So I think he's better right-handed. John Bond was good. It's very difficult to come back so soon after the slower chase. Now, I know it was also Edward Stone, but... Um, I personally thought that John Bond had a slightly harder race than people thought, maybe in the slower. And I, I thought he was good. You know, he beats him by what nine lengths turns into three lengths. The time was okay. It was four lengths, sorry, four seconds quicker than the Henry VIII. And on Sunday, El Fabiolo was five seconds quicker than the mayor's uh, chase. So both times were good. Both of them jumped well. Um, I think that if the two of them jumped the exact same, they actually jumped quite similar last year in the arc. They both made a few little bit of mistakes. I looked at it recently, and I think if the two of them jump similar, El Fabiola is a better engine as we saw last year. So uh, John Bond will probably take it up uh, at the top of the hill, etc. Uh, but if El Fabiola jumps well, I think he'll win. He made two slight mistakes in Cork. Uh, one quite early and then a slight mistake at last. 
when the Jack Paul was just trying to get him over the last, really, as usual. So, yeah, I think El Fabiolo is the right favourite, definitely. Do you, do you think on better ground that um, John Bond could possibly get a little bit closer to El Fabiolo? He's definitely had two really difficult races in the ground that he's had, and he's still proven that he's a class animal by beating the horses that we've seen so far. Would you, would you think he'd have a better chance on a better surface, Gav? Yeah, he probably would. Um, you know, his jumping is, is, is excellent. Uh, John Bond this season, he was, um, he was poor last year, one or, once, once or twice. Um, he was okay in the article, but this year his jump is definitely a lot better. Mm. Um, I still think there's no real angle to John Bond because if he was seven to two, you might back him each way. But now that he's five to two, you can't back him each way. So I definitely, I haven't had a bet in the champion chase. If I was going to have a bet and you got evens, but then again, back in a horse three months out, I'd even money is not exactly exciting. So uh, on the day, they're probably going to be what eight to 11 and nine to four, will they? So maybe, maybe I'd sooner wait. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd sooner wait, to be honest. I think, like you said, they run in eight to eleven, one to two. No, no doubt there for uh, for El Fabiolo, I guess, on the day. Jane, what did you think of the pair? Obviously, we know that John Bond's got a little bit to find. Did you think he showed enough to close any sort of gap on El Fabiolo? Um, to be honest with you, Joe, no, uh, I can't see him over turning that article form with El Fabiolo. Um, I still think he's a class above John Bond, especially around Chetlam. I'm like John Bond's. Jumping out to the left when under pressure, you could see it slightly, kind of slightly jinx mm-hmm. to one way. And he did it at Sandown, and he did it in the slur on the last. If you see, if you watch it back, um, it's an interesting comment that Paul Townend said after the race that we weren't going quick enough, and that we need a target like Dice Artaino. No, Dice Artaino would be perfect for him in a race. He'll go off, and the thing is, will John Bond try to go with him? And that might be my burnout, John Bond. Mm-hmm. I still think the quicker they go, the faster they go. I can't see John Bond overturning the form. I think I've Fabio is still a class apart, and I think still think he's meant. But I agree with Gavin. You're not going to be taking even money now, are you? Just this, this far out, three months before a festival. But I still think he'll win, and uh, it'll be it's a clash. And uh, hopefully, and it wouldn't. The other thing is, I wouldn't it wouldn't bother me if John Bond beats him at Ascot. But I still don't do, can't see him beat him at all at all. No, that's just for me. Al Fabiolo looked much bigger as well this season. I noticed yeah. he was quite a small sort of sort last year, but physically, even on the telly this year, he just looked like a much bigger horse. I suppose as well, Al Fabiolo is a six-year-old, isn't he? Got John Bonds a seven, so I suggest mm-hmm. that could obviously bring a little bit more improvement out in Al Fabiolo still. Um, and I try and defend John Bond every single time, but he's got such a gap to try and uh, close with Al Fabiolo. I just find it hard to see anything being turned around. I guess John Bond's got to go from the front and hope that Al Fabiolo makes more than one mistake in behind, because I still think Al Fabiolo can make a mistake and still pick up John Bond, providing he jumps well. But either way, it's going to be a really intriguing battle when we eventually get to March. Okay, so... Joe, we... yes. I was just going to say to you, the tactics in the champion chase are going to be very interesting, right? Okay. So you have two choices if you're John Bond. You have to do something. You can't just go around at a normal speed. If he goes really fast to try and get El Fabiola's jumping under pressure, if he doesn't make a mistake, that will really suit El Fabiola. Yes. So the other choice to, to Nico is to go slow and then turn it into a bit of a sprint, wing the last two and see can he get two lengths. So I just it'll be very interesting to see what they do. They probably will go for the fast run race and try and put a jump under pressure, but you do have the option of doing the opposite. I guess Can I just the... jump in there, what Gavin yeah, just said? Go for it, Sky. I've been looking at the, the the pace angle from the race. We haven't seen him yet, but I'm wondering if J.P. McManus, if all's well, gentlemen, to me, he didn't make chance with uh, Cheltenham last year. Would they chuck him in as a pacemaker? Yeah, definitely. I think that could be could be an option. They talk about him like he's a proper graded animal. He seems to be a little bit better as well in his last few runs as well. But again, he is one of those horses that maybe looks a little bit seasonal. And would he almost be wasted as a pacemaker in a champion chase and maybe send him somewhere else where he can pick up some good money? Um yeah, look, I mean, all things considered, it's going to be a little bit of a better matchup than what people are giving it, um, giving it hope for. And I suppose that that little um, slight peck on landing at the last for Al Fabiolo is just a reminder that horses do fall as well. So like you said, probably won't want to take the even money about Al Fabiolo yet, but on the day, he's probably going to go off, like Gav said, 8 to 11 or even shorter. Okay, so over at Sandown, we had a really nice novice chase over three miles between Stay Away Faye and Giovinco. Both really nice horses. Stay away phase of Shantu. Giovinco's a walk in the park. So both really big, stout, staying types. Um, hard to sort of weigh them up at the moment because even coming over the last, Giovinco actually hit the other side of the uh, the, the fence first before stay away phase. 
and he was still on the snaff at the time. But Stay Away Fade just seemed to find and find and find. And I got a feeling that Giovinco perhaps just looks more like something like an entry horse, whereas Stay Away Fade could be more versatile, obviously already winning at uh, at Cheltenham. But of course, they're not the only contenders. Uh, Jamie, what did you think of these two performances? And is there anything else lurking in this division at the moment? Um, I, I suppose the ground was half is the main f- focus. Uh, Giovinco travelled like a very good horse. Um, but Stay Fe, Fe always looks like he's a real stare with a kick at the end. He looks like he has a kick at the end. Um, the other, the, I suppose, if it was a bit of better ground, uh, I thought maybe he'd have picked him up. But I might actually agree with you there, Joe. He might be an entry horse. And does he really stay three miles, Jeevan Cope? I think uh, I've seen there that a faster pace, maybe, and a better ground would suit Jeevan to get him home. But that would worry me then. Would he stay up the hill at Cheltenham? Uh, the only other ones really you have to have the saver still on Florian Porter especially within two stairs hurdle he still he likes him. a little bit of class above them still and uh, the last day I just put a line through it uh, uh, at Punchestown wouldn't take it's any that, notice of it he it's, that whole right right hand, it's that whole right yeah, hand thing him. isn't it he needs um, to be I suppose into the future Willie Mullins hasn't got going yet he still has a few darts to be drawn and I suppose the one stand out is classical dream I will save a classical dream he probably will go three miles and I think he'd be more suited to the tighter old track than the new track and that might be get him home. Uh, he still has the back class. You can all see that. But um, at the moment, I would be siding with the two Irish horses and not being patriotic or anything. Um, but Florian Porter and Classical Dream still look have a little bit better class than Stay Away FA and Giovinco at, the more... present, at the present time. That's it. They're proven, aren't they, for, for now as well. And they're, they've they got a little bit of age on their side as well. But it'd be amazing if we saw over those two win those novice chase. What I will say there about Giovinco, though, Jay, we are, I think we've got to be careful when we say about horses not necessarily staying just because they've been beaten. I mean, mm. it could obviously turn out that they've both turned out to be turned out to be very, very smart horses. I think Giovinco is probably a stayer. Um it's just whether he's, I suppose, as effective in a in a in a sprint finish, if that if that's what it's going to turn out to be. But again, time will tell tell with those two, I guess. Um, Gav, uh, what did you think of the pair this weekend? Yeah, I thought it was okay. <clears throat> um, I wasn't blown away by either. Uh, it was a bit messy the side of the pond fence with the loose horse. Obviously, uh, it probably inconvenienced Giovinco more with the second incident. Um, he travelled the better horse, but I'd say I suppose the the Cotto star if he goes that way, that would suit him. A uh, flat track, decent ground. He travels very strongly. Uh, I think that five to one stay away for the um, uh, the RSA. The Brown Advisory is too short. And just to say one thing, the handicap chase that was won by a horse rated um, 113 was five seconds quicker. Now, obviously, they went very slow on the first furlong, but just to kind of point it out, a stay away fair was given away three pounds to Giovinco. But I just think if you look back to last year's Brown, the um, Albert Bartlett, second Afferdale Fury, third Sander Clegan, fourth. Uh, let's be clear about it, fifth uh, three-card brag. I just don't think it was the strongest race. I think on the old course for the um, the Brown Advisory, you have to have some gears, and I would worry if it was on the, the new track, I'd prefer stay away fair, but I definitely couldn't back that horse five to one. When you see the likes of Grange Clare West, Classical Dream, Corbett's Cross, um, Factifile, uh, today's winner in Punchdown, um, Embassy Gardens, maybe Indiana Dream, Flooring Porter, etc. I just think it's I think it's a deep enough race. There's still lots more to come. And at some stage in the Brown Advisory, I think Stay Away Fay will get tapped for toe. Jumps think, brilliantly now. I think um, I think a lot of the bookies now, Gav, I don't know what you think, hype and things like that seem to just affect the markets as well. We can have things happen just on the basis that we haven't seen other horses even run yet. It just seems to be a little bit of a mad world at the moment with the, the anti-post side of things. I guess popularity is obviously a big part in that too. But Gav, just one more quick question. Where does Hermes Alen fit in for Nichols in the novice chase uh, chase ranks? Is he a three uh, model or is he better in the Turners? Is he a Cheltenham horse at all, I guess? Uh, yeah, well, you see, question. Paul, yeah, sometimes he likes to skip Cheltenham and go to Aintree to win a grade one there. So I could see that happening. He'd like the flat track. So I would say, if I had to guess, I would say that he might skip Cheltenham, but perhaps he could be a Brown advisory, more so than a Turner's, but yeah, I'd say maybe entry. Just can't believe how small he is as a horse for, for such a good chaser. Of course, Tiger Roll was tiny and he's won a Grand National, so it doesn't always mean everything, but another nice so You have to say that Paul, Paul Nichols is amazing at getting the horse to jump a fence. He's just incredible at it. Yeah, he, he seems to have proper old 
old school steeplechasers are the one like like Clan Dezobo. He's got another one that ran this weekend called Isaac Dezobo as well. He looks like another really big chaser in the making. So I'm happy to I'm always happy to give Nichols a couple of years with his novice hurdlers to see if they turn into better chasers. It just seems to be the way that the uh he buys his horses as well, doesn't it? Um yeah, definitely. Scotty, what about you? Um Stay away Faye, Giovinco, Hermes Elena, or like Jamie said, Floor and Porter. No, I was there at Sandown, as you know, and I was I was impressed with Stairway Faye's attitude again. Um, without sounding like a real clever clog, I was standing there watching it on my phone because Sandown didn't have the big screen up. So I was watching it live on my phone. And as soon as Stairway Faye decided to make the running, I thought, in my head, if I was riding this race, he'll be jumping two out, he'll get taken on for the lead, and he'll kick on and he'll outstage Yevinko in the ground, which is what happened. But I think, like like Gavin raised the point in there, that when the horses were hampered three out, I think it was a bit of um, unseen clever race uh, riding from Harry Cobden. I think he stole a bit of ground on Giovinco and the inexperienced jockey, don't know, Derek Fox wasn't riding Giovinco. I think Harry Cobden made a, a wise and a sensible decision there by going up on that inside and he jumped uh, the last pretty well and outstayed him. Um, again, I'd be worried about the uh, course at Cheltenham for the Browns for stay away fee. Um, five to one is too short. I wouldn't be getting involved. Um, Giovinco for me, he's going to be running in the quarter at Christmas. I don't like the the race coming that quickly for him. I think uh, they tried it with a hoist senior a few years ago, didn't they? And um, he didn't really take to the track at Kempton. He struggled a bit when he got beat by a brave man's game. Um, I'd be looking at the, the Paul Nichols placing of horses. I think um, Gavin. Um, said there he likes to send horses to entry and you said the same I think Hermes Allen may pop up in something like the Silly Isles and take on the likes of Colonel Harry that raced in the um, in the Henry VIII I think he's going up for a step up and trip and I think he'll be sending Nappers Hill to the one at Christmas so I wouldn't be too worried about Hermes Allen I think he may turn up in the Turners Paul Nichols likes Chelton runners but from um, out of the two I wouldn't have stay away for as a festival winner I, I, I've gone off him slightly um, in the last few days I was actually impressed with Embassy Gardens today. I get really slated by backing this horse and sticking up for him. I think he's got a good attitude. I was really impressed with him today. But from a value perspective in the in the market, looking down the field, I mean, if they send Indiana Dream over three miles, I think he'd be tough to beat. I don't know whether he'll go that way. But Flooring Porter, I'd definitely be giving him another chance. And I don't think he's raced on the old course at Cheltenham. I think he won two stairs hurdles, obviously, on the new course. So I think if it came down to a race between Stayway Faye and Flooring Porter, um, I think Flooring Porter would have too much speed and he'd be my idea of the winner at the moment. I'll have a showdown that would be if Flooring Porter just kicks for home and Stayway's chasing him up the hill. That would be a brilliant matchup to watch. OK, cool. Nice one, guys. Well, let's move on. We will take a look at the matchup that we have between Firefox and Ballyburn. Again, Firefox is another horse I really like. He's a big walk in the park type again. He probably did get the run of the race that day. Um doesn't do too many things wrong which I do quite like and probably a horse not to be underestimated despite the race looking like it was quite slowly run um Gav what did you think think of Firefox and uh Ballyburn of course he had that awkward head carriage as well that can't be ideal um especially if they want to step him up in trip I guess yeah, I think they're two very, very good horses. Uh, last year when Firefox made his debut, I think it was over two and a half miles over hurdles in Navin. He was a huge eye catcher. And then he came back to bumpers. Um, and we all thought he was going to be a two and a half, three miler. But then he has shown uh, more gears at Down Royal again at Fairy House. He wins by two and a half lengths from Ballyburn. Um, super ride from Jack. Very, very slowly run race. Uh, the overall time wasn't great. Uh, they finished 12 lengths clear of Ron C and a few other eye catchers. Uh, I'd imagine the Mullins camp aren't giving up on Ballyburn yet, obviously. Um, some of Willies are taking a run. They're not fully fit. Firefox has had a run. I think they're really two super horses. Will they end up in the same race at Cheltenham, the Supreme or the Ballymore? That's anybody's guess at the moment. Uh, it's very hard to, to judge. I think if you if you really like one of them, I think you're better off to wait to get an idea. For example, if one of them got declared for the Lawlers of Nace over two and a half, at least then you know that they're not going to go in the Supreme unless they happen to not stay on the yeah, day or whatever. Interesting. But mm -hmm. but um I think taking a chance on back in one of those for one of those races now, I think that's crazy. Um because you couldn't be sure which race they're going to run in at the moment. Ballyborn maybe might end up in a Ballymore, but you just wouldn't be hundred percent sure just yet. Hard to weigh the pair up, I guess, isn't it, after you know, just seeing that so far and um Ballyburn, he just looks so awkward. I think if they want to step him up in trip, if they want to step up in trip, then he's definitely going to have to learn to settle because he's probably just not going to stay if that's the case. But um, 
Loved what Firefox did. I just feel like potentially Ballyburn's the one that's maybe open to a little bit more. Jamie? Um, you, like Firefox. you like I Firefox. I like Firefox, I but I like, yeah. I like Ballyburn more. Okay. I always have. <laughs> I think both need to step up maybe to two and a half miles. And the next day, I think Ballyburn will definitely strip fitter. Uh, I suppose in the back of your head with Ballyburn, he's obviously owned by Mr. Bartlett. And um, like, could he end up there? Um for the, his, <laughs> for, for the yeah, but for the Albert Bartlett uh, because of the owner, um, very hard to choose which race he's going to go with yet. I found it very strange because the way he ran in bumpers, that he he could go. I thought in my head that he could go flat out and let him go, and Firefox wouldn't be able to catch him, kind of a thing. But I, it looked like a, a very teaching ride from town and to get him to settle. Uh, so I wouldn't take any notice. But they are very two very very good horses. Uh, but the division is very open at the moment. To me, at the moment, Willmount stands out like a sore thumb at the moment. But they all need a better, better, better competition to see who is the best. But I think they'll both step up and trip. I, I don't know. Will you see both of them in the Supreme? I think they will see both of them in a Ballymore. That's being honest with you at the moment. But look, a lot to play for. Christmas will tell a lot. Firefox probably too go to two and a half, two mile of us against Daddy Longlegs. And probably Ballyburn might be running in a two mile maiden hurdle, two and a half mile maiden hurdle. So interesting times, but at the moment, I prefer, at the moment I prefer Wilmont, but I'm a huge Ballyburn yeah, fan. Yeah, you do keep mentioning Wilmont every time you have a conversation. He's there somewhere in the uh, in the equation. Um, Scotty, any different opinion on the two here? Again, they're quite hard to weigh up at the moment, but you know, what did you what do you think? I thought in the um normally I get excited when I watch like maiden hurdles and like the Fernie Hollow Bob Ollinger race from years ago. I thought Firefox between those final two flights, you just absolutely put the race to bed in a matter of strides. And for me, I'd be worried about Ballyburn over a shorter trip just um just from that uh, visual impression. I don't know what the times are, I'm not a times man, but I'm not sure how quick that race was run. But uh I'd be definitely looking at Ballybone going up in trip. Um, and even so for Firefox, it's, it's seven is the field for the Ballymore and, and six is the field for the Supreme. It says it all, doesn't it? You've got the likes of Mirazar West, who I believe we're going to see at Leopardstown at Christmas. I think he's got an entry. I think he could um, put in a good performance and jump to the head of the Supreme market. I think that would kind of be the one I'd be looking at. Um, JP's also got, obviously, Jericho de Rupine, down memory lane, all these other top um, potential novices. It's, it's pretty much a guessing game, but I think the best novice I've seen at the moment is um, is El Atlantique. I was really impressed with him over two miles at Gowron. Um, I, I backed him for the Albert Bartlett. It's one of the very few anti-post bets I've had this year. I think um, Willie likes to, as we said in our last episode, uh, campaign Albert Bartlett horses over a shorter trip, then step them up in time. But out of the ones that we've seen so far, I, I actually think Ballyburn might be saved and go in the Moscow fly like Imperio Pass did last year and then potentially step up to the Ballymore, and what they do with Firefox is a guess. I think he will probably go for the race, Gavin said. It's the, the Lawless and Nace, perhaps, is, a, is an option. Um, I think they went a similar route with Ginto a few years ago, uh, those kind of horses. But, yeah, I mean, Ronnie Bartlett, the owner, he likes to – I don't think he likes starting horses in Supremes at festivals. I don't think he's ever had a Supreme win, uh, win, uh, runner, even. I think Galvin ran in the Ballymore. Um, Statlow was his Albert Bartlett horse. Uh, uh, Simon Sig won a Ballymore for him, even though he screamed as a two-miler. So – it's just from previous history and um, things like that. That's the way I look at it. But I do think the best English novice is Will Mount. I agree with Jamie. I think he'll be um, a good thing for the Tollworth at Aintree if he goes in that. But at the moment, it's still pretty much a guessing game. But Il Atlantique is my top novice at the moment. Is he going for the Ballymore or the Bartlett? Il what, Il Atlantique? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 100% the Albert Bartlett. I'd you say. reckon, yeah? Okay, fair enough. That's nice. Nice to see him go up and trip for sure. Um, well, you mentioned Imperi Pass there briefly, Scotty. Of course, we had Tia Hoopoo versus Imperi Pass in the Hatton's Grace. Um, again, a lot of people just looking at this race as more of a disappointment for Imperi Pass. Personally, I saw this as a big win for Tia Hoopoo. He looked to me like a horse that stepped forward. And a lot of people gave up on him just because he was beat last year. I don't like this idea at all. He was a he was a novice not too long before that. He's improving. He's bigger. He's stronger. He is without doubt the one to beat at this point in time. I was disappointed with Imperi Pass, but again, you've got to give some of them their credit that they're moving and uh, coming on for their first run. Um, Gav, what did you think of the Hatton's Grace? It was quite it's quite a tough one to weigh up at the moment, but Tia Hoopu clearly sets a good uh, good standard for sure. Yeah, he won the race second year in a row. <clears throat> I would imagine that Imperi Pass and Astro Diamond weren't fully fit. Uh, Imperi Pass was a massive drifter, especially in the last five minutes before the off. 
he literally touched even money, which you wouldn't have believed that on Sunday morning. Uh, I was chatting to one of the owners of Astro Diamond and he said that she definitely needed the run. So uh, she's only rated 140. Uh, Imperial Pass uh, looked all over winner before the, you know, between the second last and the last. Look, at he's going to have to improve tons from that to compete with Constitution Hill. But I'd imagine he's going to go to the champion hurdle. Which horse will Paul ride in the champion? Him or Stateman? They'll probably meet in the Irish champion hurdle at the end of January, early February. And then Paul will have his decision made from. Um, Tiupu is good. Uh, he's going straight to the stairs. Just, you'd wonder why he couldn't have won it last year. Like, uh, the ground was very soft on the Thursday last year. So that's still sticking in my head. He's got a massive chance. Uh, himself and the French horse, Telem, are obviously the two favourites, and rightly so. The, the stairs hurdle division this year is very, very poor. So uh, Gordon felt that going to the Galway last year <clears throat> didn't do him any good. Now, he had quite an easy race that day, but um, the fact that going straight there, he's only six turning seven, so he's the perfect age. Um, yeah, like he, he won the the um, the Hatton's Grace last year and didn't win the, the stairs against horses who were like yeah. 10 and 11 at the time. Mm-hmm. So Anyway, um, it's it's a weak division, and I suppose he he should be favourite, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, I suppose the we can look at Dash or Drash has gone on and run well, obviously, really since uh, run well since obviously that that day as well. Um, I definitely think he's still an improving horse. I I definitely like Tia Hoopu quite a lot here. Um, Jane, what do you think? Uh, I see a lot of people Joe they were cribbing the ride in town, in but uh, like to know when they coming into the straight, was he holding on too much? And he was outstayed by us there, but look, that was it was slow enough. It looks look, it was was it twenty seconds slower than the previous year, and it looked like more, way more what mud splattered when he beat Classical Dream and Honeysuckle that day. But it was a faster time. Um, I'd be worried about Imperial passing the champion hurdle then because if he's been beaten in a speed sprint with Tupu going up to Fairy House straight, I will be very worried. Would he get anywhere near Constitution Hill? Which uh, look, he's obviously going to improve for the run. But Tupu, I agree with Kevin. It's that nagging doubt in your head that he couldn't beat Sarder Burley and Dashiell Drasher last year, and that was his chance. But he still was only six year old. He's a seven year old now next year. Uh, hopefully, he's improves. Um, I don't take any notice that he's going straight to the stairs hurdle. To be honest with you, uh, the French horse obviously is the most interesting one. If the ratings are correct, is he ten pound clearer than everybody? But yes. I was looking at the R- 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 RPRs. Like if, if you look at the highest RPRs. Tupu is one six eight and Tilem is one six five and that's a bog ground in France. Do you know what I mean? Um, I actually watched the race last night because I was actually watching the Ruby Watch thing. And then I watched Sarah's Earl because it was wrecking my head. And the horse that stood out to me you now and he was poor in the race with Bob Ollinger last day was home by the lead. The amount of mistakes he's made and he was awkward. I know it was a pipe opener the last day in Navin, but he'd be interesting for me at Christmas. The race he won last year, just to keep an eye on him because. He, he made a lot of mistakes last year in the stairs hurdle and plus two you don't have Florian Porter in the race this year so Ruin there are the very yeah. very where's the pace coming from now that maybe will probably suit Tupu more the slower to go he'll pick up better than everybody up the straight but it's a wide open race if you can call that winner and no, Jamie but, uh, yes uh, just to say I think that uh, home by the Lee and Navin was given the other two I think 10 pounds from memory yeah. so yeah, he st- he just stood out like a sore thumb to me, Gavin. Last night I was watching. I actually watched it about three or four times. Mm-hmm. I was pausing it, pausing it, stopping it, pausing it. I mean, like if he jumped properly, he'd have been there. He, he would have been record. there, and a, a lot of people have forgotten about him. Do you know he what I mean? And that's just me. At one so, point last year, yeah. he was he was a yeah, real yeah. talking horse, just, wasn't he? And he, yeah, he, he was, he was, yeah. So it was a horse that he discounted on the day because I backed you for last year on the stairs hurdle, and I looked at it. My God, yeah, maybe. Throwing the cat yeah. out of the bag there a small bit, but look, yeah, he's stuck to me and he's been forgotten about. So well, look, we'll give him a chance. He's a big price at the moment as well. If anyone does want to get stuck in at that price as well, um, Scotty, Tia Hoopoo, uh, and Perry Pass, how did it go down really? Do you? Uh, I watched it um, in town with a good friend of mine, and um, I, I said to someone in Sandown again on Saturday, I, I don't get as worried when horses drift from, say, like a five to two right before they're up to four, five to one. I still backed them. But when Gavin basically said it, he said four to seven opened up, went off touch of even money, same as Gallop and the Shump and John Durkin. It just goes to show that they know that Willies have got to come on for a run possibly at the moment. Ashray Diamond, another example. Um, yeah, and Tiapu, he does exactly what he says on the tin, doesn't he? He goes well fresh. He, he likes the heavier ground, the softer ground. 
Um, I said it in the last preview we did together, um, horses who don't win their first championship race um, seldom come back and win. I think it's like a, a 9% strike rate. They come back and win it the second year. Um, if he was going to do it, I think he would have done it last year. And in Pere Pass, I didn't think he lost a lot in defeat. I think he's... Um, it's just, the only thing with two and a half mile chases in England and two and a half mile hurdlers in, in Ireland, there's not a massive campaign where they can target races. There's not many options for them. So you probably will have to go to the Irish champion hurdle, take on State Man um, in February. But um, I'm really not bothered about either of them from an anti-post perspective. But from the stairs hurdle market, I, uh, there's two horses who I think, um, one of them Springwell Bay. He's definitely a big outsider. But the other English horse who I like is Crambo. And um, I think he got given a terrible ride, if I'm being honest, at Haydock. I'm not a, a jockey basher. But he, the way he stayed on with with quite a big weight at that, up that Haydock straight, OK, it was a flat track. Chelton was a different kettle of fish. But I'd like to see Crambo ridden quite handy. And I think in, in that kind of race in a stairs hurdle, and if he gets a bit of better ground on his day, I definitely think he will have the toe to get past Tiapu. Um, so he'd be one I'd be looking at at a double-figure price. And I wouldn't be overly keen. On, on backing tier put four to one, put it this way, not now anyway. I think that I think that Crambo is going to be a handicap job. I reckon he was ridden like a handicapper. I don't think Fergal O'Brien seemed too annoyed after as well when he was talking about the ride for Connor Brace. Either really, he's probably going to have a chance which whichever race he goes up. But to me, it definitely looks like they're going to try and find a handicap. I know you and Jamie both quite fancy him to a degree for this day as obviously if it, if it all goes the only other one that um, we mentioned way back and it seemed like a popular kind of lazy option was Irish Point I know he's owned by Ribcor as well but I think if he ran he'd definitely have a chance but I'd like to see him run over three miles first but I would definitely think he'd be going for the Galmoy instead of Tiapu but he's definitely one that I would give a chance to as well the thing with the thing with uh, Irish Point as well is Gordo just loves Cheltenham winners, so it wouldn't be surprising yeah. if he ran well obviously at Christmas or at the DRF, and then they decided to send him here anyway because Gordo wants those winners, doesn't he? All right, okay, nice one then, guys. Um, just a quick question: if there has been an eye catcher from the weekend, I've actually got one from this weekend, as I've mentioned briefly, which was Isaac Desobo. He is a very very nice horse. Again, he actually drifted in the market before the race, but Paul Nichols did tell us on the Betfair um, channel last week that this horse would win. He put him up as his bet for the week. He's a very, very likable horse. And just want to mention for the week before, I possibly have my first bumper horse on the radar if he goes. That's a horse called Yalon Du Dury for uh, Gordon Elliott in Gigginstown. He was a really, really nice mover to win his bumper um, the week before. I think those two are worth, um, worth something going forward. Um, Jamie, have you got any eye catchers at all, or again, not essential, but anything stand out just while we're on that subject? From just the weekend, gone is this? Um, I anything, suppose the, Jamie, anything, anything. I suppose I have three, well, two from the weekend, obviously, as we mentioned, obviously, it was Indiana Dream. Where, we, where is he going to go? I thought, no, Gavin would be better to me than that. The, the times wise, um, I thought Chigaro was impressive the way he ran up to Navin straight. The Bective Stud uh, horse who won the opener, yes, didn't he? Yeah, won the opener yeah. at Nevin. He was, uh, he looked visually, he looked very good. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other one I mentioned as well before to you, uh, Joe, was I with the race that Hans had won, uh, at uh, Newbury. The way under control traveled into the race, and all of a sudden he just obviously bombed mm -hmm. out and mm -hmm. needed the run. She needed the run. Um, I know she wasn't great last year in the mayor's novice, uh, but it just screens me here, here, heard it here first. Um, I think she's another dame to company. And might run in that two and a half mile trials handicap at uh, Cheltenham on trials day, and then, and then to the then then send her to the Carl Cup. Um, it's just in my head she travels like a, a very good horse, likes likes a bit of pace, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't put anyone off. No, it's a stab in the dark, shot in the dark, but got got a price maybe on it. Too? I don't off the top nope. of my head, but All if right. I if I got a price, I'd back her as a a novelty bet at this stage. Cool, uh, Joe. Cool, lovely, nice one, Jane. Scott, you've got any eye catchers at all? Yeah, Jamie's stealing my thunder again uh, this <laughs> week. Um, the one that I picked out was um, Colonel Harry running on into second in the Henry VIII at Sandown. I definitely think um, he made a bit of a hash of the third last and um, obviously Le Patron was jumping well, got away from him. He wasn't beaten that far, so I think he'd be a good thing. Step up and trip in the um, in the Silly Isles. Um, I think it's run early February. Yeah. It's in the Dublin Racing Festival weekend, isn't it? That same weekend. So I'd be, I'd be keen to see how he goes. And another one, which is a bit of a sneaky one, it's a bit of a cheeky one. It's um, a horse Dan Skelton's got, and it finished third on the weekend, and that's called Vicky Vale. Um, rated 121 now. I'm not sure what she'd have to get into to get into the Martin Pipe, 
down the line at the festival. Um, I think Oroko won it last year off 138. I don't know if it was that high. It could have been 138. Um, but she's, even if it's not something like the Martin Pipe, maybe something like um, a bet for a hurdle or something down the line for that, she'd be one I'd be keen on. Run a couple of good races. Another one at Wing Canton on the uh, the same card that Rubo and Hansard ran on. Uh, she's another one that I think had potential to um, get into a handicap off a good mark. They do seem to have some quite nice uh, horses. I can't remember who owns who owns her, but they got obviously West Barbo. They had Roxana as well. Yeah, really nice horses. Uh, Mrs. Sarah Folks. Sorry, I forgot the name, but yeah, there we go. Gav, any eye catchers recently, or has you know? Um, I haven't really gave you any prep for this one. Is there is there anything? That's, that's all right. Um, just to say to Jamie there, the Jigoro compared to Caldwell Potter was twelve seconds slower, but then again. You know, you can't hang your hat on that completely. It's just that Jack went slow on Jigoro and then uh, wished away in, in the straight. So he was good. Caldwell Potter is very good as well related. Um, Sorry, Gav, uh, to come across you. Would that bring in It's For Me then for you, like after that, like to know the way It's For Me was so keen at Punchestown and he still know, beat him? He's just, yeah, he's he's just awkward, mad, doesn't he? He's, he's a bit mad, isn't he? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's very, very keen. Like you just, yeah. it's very hard if you're thinking about Cheltenham and stuff. It's very hard to win a grade one being that keen. So, are they going to make the running with him? Or are they going to sit him in behind, settle him down, etc.? So I'd be against him just for the moment until he learns how to race. But uh, my trump card, I suppose, maybe is the one from the weekend Ooh, yes. in terms of Christmas. If he, he runs in a maiden hurdle over two and a half at Leopardstown, uh, he won't go to Limerick. He'll go to Leopardstown. They'll be taking a very good horse of Willie's or maybe Henry's or, or Gavin's to beat him. Uh, he's a very, very good horse. He's 33 to 1 for Bartlett, 50s for the Ballymore, I think. Uh, I'm not saying he'll win that, but he's a very good horse. And... Uh, as I said, uh, he has jumping experience. So, um, if he shows up at, at Christmas, he'd be hard beat. Both for Bechtiv Stud, I believe, as well, aren't they? My Trump card and Jigger Oats, to be fair. So, definitely got some nice horses horses coming through yeah. this season, that's for sure. Okay, cool. Uh, right, we're going to do one more section. We're going to have a look at the same time. Uh, so, if we talk about a horse, we can mention the King George and the Gold Cup if we feel necessary. And then we've just got a couple of questions for Gav to finish up as well. So, Scotty, kick us off with the King George and the Gold Cup. Just you know, just give us a bit of a feel for where your head's at for the pair at the moment. Very much up in the air, both of them, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, the King George obviously comes first. Um, Brave Man's Game uh, hasn't had the same preparation this year. I'd be worried about him. Um, I think Haydock, oh, it's hard to say if it's left the mark, but you wouldn't think it'd be the best preparation for him. I thought he would have just run in the Charlie Hall and gone straight there. Alaho, is he going to turn up? I don't know. And after so many uh, months off, second run, he's obviously he's obviously not a certainty to even um, be in the same form as he has been for the last couple of years. Um, I think that Clonmel Clon oil chase, well, I don't know visually how good that was. or um, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, Shishkin, he, he's missed his prep run on the weekend and then uh, obviously didn't start in the um, the race previously to that. So you're looking at Jerry Colom at 13 to 8 and you're thinking... Is he even going to run? Would you want to get stuck into him? I wouldn't. I don't think he's. I don't think he's going to be suited by Kempton. I just got this impression. Um, I know he ran over a short trip at Limerick, going right-handed, won the Grade One, which was which was okay. I just don't think going away from the back of his fences, he's the quickest to um, run with momentum. I think that's kind of what's cost him in yeah. obviously mm -hmm. being so far back in the Browns, and I think he's just a, a bit of a slow jumper getting away from his fences. I might get laughed here at here, but I honestly think a horse who I've always had a lot of time for, and he may run. And you look at the likes of Frodon, the likes of Tornado Flyer, you don't have to be a superstar to win the King George anymore, like a Quarto star, like a Q card, those kind of horses. I'm looking at something like Pick Dory at 16 to 1. Um, I think he's not a bad horse going right-handed. Definitely um, got the Kempton form in the book. Um, I think the better the ground, the better his chances. And I would definitely give him a squeak each way at 16. Edward Stone at 20, he's not going to run. I think he's going to go to the Ryanair and um, have a race before that. And then looking at everything else in the race, you've got Hewick, who I believe is a runner at 40 to 1. He's um, got some good form going right-handed, won at Sandown towards the end of last season. And he's a good jumper. And I think if he puts in a decent round, similar to what Frodon did, at 40 to 1, I mean, if we only get six runners and you take the three places each way now, he could be a squeak. But if, you're, if I'm being 100% honest and they all turned up on their day, on their absolute peak form, Brave Man's Game is still the one to beat. But it's not a strong opinion. And same with the Gold Cup. Jerry Colomb, I'm on 8-1, to one and um, I think the course will suit him. And I really haven't got a strong opinion at the, in this stage. I wouldn't be as keen on Gallop in the Champs as what this, was this time last year. 
I think fast or slow is obviously the improving horse. You'd have to give him respect, but I haven't got a massive strong opinion. I find we can revisit that one, Scotty, obviously in the next few episodes. Um, Gav, how do you see the King George and the Gold Cup at the moment? First of all, do you think Jerry's going to come over? Um, and then also with regards to the Gold Cup after, do you think fast or slow is this new improver that could possibly take over the new crown? Is he good enough to be that sort of horse? Uh, so I think uh, Gordon Ellie today at Punchestown after having a couple of winners uh, he gave a quote to say that uh, Jerry Colomb is doing a piece of work this Friday but the plan is to run at Kempton okay. uh, so that's what I read uh, the obvious thing to say is that the Gold Cup over three miles two at an uphill finish will suit him far more than Kempton but I'm actually probably going to back him uh, in Kempton he's 13 to 8 as Scott said that's with Paddy Power but you can also get 3 to 1 at the moment with uh, Skybet Oh, okay. Uh, wow. and there's also uh, there's eleven to four there with bet three six five. There's eleven to four with uh, Ladbrokes etc. And Carl's the uni bet. So I think eleven to four Jerry Clam is fine, even though you'd have a small nagging doubt about uh, the flat track three miles. But he did win at Sandwin over two and a half. The two runs for Brave Man's game would turn me off him. Uh, Shishkin, I don't think he travels as well as as he should or he used to. And the fact that he stopped the last day is not a positive. I have backed the Aloe over the Ryanair, so I hope he skips uh, the King George and goes to the horse and jockey in January in Perlis uh, before going to the Ryanair. I think it's not a strong King George. Um, if Jerry Kalam wins the King George, obviously then I'd say he'd probably go favourite to the Gold Cup. But I would slightly prefer uh, fast or slow. Um, he's only seven turn and eight. I think he's only had five or six runs over Francis. I love the fact that he won a chase in France at the age of three, which is just amazing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Very unusual. More of it, I said. Very ah, yeah, it's great. as well, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, you know, Al Boom Photo ran at the age of three and he was still fine at 10, you know. Wow. But um, fast or slow is six to one for the the Gold Cup there with Ladbrokes, etc. I think that's that's fine. Uh, I had a plan that he was going to get beat and well beat in the John Durkin and then he'd be 10 to one for the Gold Cup. But unfortunately, he went and won it. That, that was my plan <laughs> yeah. round. Um, but I think he's very good. He's very, very unexposed. Like, when you look back at his runs, uh, since he came to Martin Brazil. His first run for Martin, I think, was in the John Durkin a year ago. And he jumped brilliant. He actually ran quite well. He then went to the Dublin Chase over two miles one. He then went to the Ultima. Then he wins at Punchestown. I didn't think necessarily that was a fluke because that means that Envoy Allen, Brave Man's Game and uh, Gallop and the Champ all underperformed. So yeah, of course, it's a bit of a of stretch to say that all three did. Uh, I thought he'd get beat in the John Durkin and then I'd be laughing. But uh, as I said, he went and won. But he certainly has a good chance in the Gold Cup. Uh, he's 2 nil against Gallop and Deschamp. And, um, you know, we shouldn't forget that. Loved Gallop and Deschamp last year. The fact that he's now got beat twice, his jumping the last day in the John Durkham wasn't good. Uh, fast or slow is a really good jumper. Um, he's a quicker jumper than Jerry Kalam and Gallop and Deschamp. So, uh, look, at the best race of the year for me is always the Gold Cup. Uh, I haven't had a bet in it yet, but uh, it's quite open, which is great. Hopefully the markets will change a little bit more as well in the uh, in the coming months. So I suppose with regards to the King George, there's a lot of runners that we've got potentially a few more question marks than answers about at the moment. Um, I've got a bit of a wild card as such that I fancy in the King George, but I better, better let Jamie talk about him first because I stole him from you, to be fair. You put me onto this horse. I am uh, warming up to the Donnelly horse that you fancy in the race. Shishkin. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> the, um, more, the more I think about it, the no, more I can see him the winning the more, race, even the if he more, comes off the dry I line. suppose I have backed him for the King George. Yeah, I backed him a long time ago. Um, it's put me off, obviously, the race on Ascot, definitely, when he did, refused. Uh, he hasn't ran. I heard the rumour he's had a race course gallop around Kempton and all this. <laughs> um, I was like Gavin, actually, about Faster Slow. I, I, I'd have gone in on Faster Slow because I thought, didn't think he'd win the Durkin. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a forgiving type. I back Faster Slow one year in a Carl's Cup and he was beaten by Commander Fleet and I'll never ever get over it, to be honest <laughs> no. with you. 66 um, to 1. Yeah. Um, he was very good. Accurate jumper. Getting better. Um. But the only thing is, and thinking out in my head, is that Gallop and Champ was still only two lengths behind, and he jumped absolutely atrociously yeah, through, through the race. And if he was beaten further, I would be getting very, very mm-hmm. worried about Gallop and Champ. Had the Gold Cup taken too much out of him? But I agree with Gavin, eleven to four, Jerry Kalam. I agree with like he's not a slow. I told you before, he's not a slow horse. He's one two and a half miles over uh, the Fedex uh, Balco Coastal in the Silly Isle last Sandown. year at Sandown. Yeah. Uh, he's won at entry. Flat track. flat track as well, track yeah. As well. Track. Yep, yep. So, look, 
11 to 4. I think he'll beat Brave Man's Game and Shishkin. Even though if he doesn't come over, I think Shishkin will win. I think Shishkin will beat Brave Man's Game. But if Jerry Clam 11 to 4 is a cracking bet. Uh, onto the Gold Cup, I'm still with Gallop and Deschamps that I'm proven other, otherwise. Yeah. Uh, I mm-hmm. think he'll win at the Dublin Racing Festival. Um, where faster slow goes, I don't know, is he going to the Savills? Or is he going to the Dublin Race Festival? We'll see then, but it's still, in my book, it's still Gallop and Deschamps is the horse to beat. He, he was only beat by a couple of lengths. Again, we write horses off way too fast. He finished his race well. And like you said, he didn't jump very well, but that's fine. He's got the whole season to get but right um, for, for the Gold Cup. As Gavin says, it's an open Gold Cup and it's great to see for one. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely so. Um, got some Joe, can I ask you a question? Here. Of course you can, Gav. If Jerry Kalam comes over uh, to the King George and the ground is the usual good to soft, um, who goes at our favourite? Good to soft, I would say... I'd say it's Jerry very, Clown, very I'd close, say. but I, but I, but I'd, I'd say J- Jerry has to go yeah. anyway because he's the one that's improving. So surely he would go off favourite over Brave Man's game on the basis that we've seen a poor prep from him. Um, yeah, I think I think Jerry Clam will go off favourite. I think eleven to four is a good price. Jerry Clam will uh, go off five to four. Brave Man's game will go off two to one. That's what I think. Did you you meant you meant the King George there? Did you, Gavin? Is that right? Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. think that uh, three to one, eleven to four. I think that's a bet. Wow, totally I mean, he's agree. coming. It's pretty much confirmed he's coming over now, from what we've heard today, right? So, GSI. But I look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with Shishkin. Jamie, you put me onto him. I'm sticking with Shishkin. I'm gonna show him some of the love that he deserves. Oh no! Oh no! And if he starts, might end up with egg on my face. Yeah. Who knows? But cool. Well, that's that's everything as far as um looking at some of the previews. Gav, me and the guys, we give out an anti post tip each week. We will leave you out of this. I'm fully aware. Obviously, you've got some up already yourself. Um, but guys, I'm actually staying out of it this week. I haven't managed to find anything that I think is worth putting up and I've got to stay true to what I find as a valuable selection. Um, Jamie, have you got anything for us this week? Um, yeah, I do, but not really with confidence, but I put them up as part of the series. Oh. Uh, she, um, I can't see anything past, uh, it would be quick and concise. I can't see anything past uh, Allegora de Vesey in the mayor's chase. Starting to look like she's the one to beat again now, isn't yes, it? With a few of the flowers. Yep. Yep. Scotty, have you got one for this week? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna put up another Irish horse. I wore my Irish shirt tonight. Three out of three <laughs> Irish <laughs> anti-posts. Um it's not a massively strong opinion. I've tipped up Imagine already, 14's any race, who I think may run now in the quarter at Christmas, I believe. It's potentially lining up for that. And in the last episode. Um, I tipped up Favre de Shamdu. So this one, I'm actually going to tip up a flat ex-flat horse who ran six times on the flat. It's still a three-year-old, and I'm going to tip it up at anti-post 25's best price on Bet365, 14's Joan Rule for the Triumph Hurdle, and that is Nurburg Ring for Joseph O'Brien. Everything, yes. Um, I really, I after timing, I, t- I told everybody I was going to back this horse the last day when it won. Um, very green. Jumped into the back of a few, but I just think this horse has so much raw ability. And I think the more experience he gets over the jumps, I think it's going to be a pretty much um, bit of a dark horse. But I think he's definitely got the potential. The form's there in the book for Wadu, who um, he, he beat her, but then the, the result got reversed. And Wadu's obviously gone and won nicely at Newbury. Um, I think there's a good bit of form. And we haven't seen the likes of Majbra, uh, Salvador Mundi, Sergino, Bunting, those kind of horses yet. Um, the only one um, from Ireland who I think looked impressive was Mighty Bandit. Um, and obviously, I've got great respect for Bird Out Road. I'd like to see him again. But I think the burger ring for Joseph at 25 is an interesting um, bet for the uh, triumph each way. That would be a small fancy. Great forward horse as well. That's really, really likeable, isn't it? It's going for that sort of race. Okay, cool. Thanks again for that then, uh, guys. Do appreciate the anti-post selections. I will have one for the next episode. Um, and just to finish off, we're just going to, um, Gav, we've just got a few questions. It's always nice just to find out a little bit about yourself. Jamie, I think you've got a few lined up. Um, my first is a very straightforward one for you, Gavin. What's your favourite horse of all time? I love a bit of nostalgia. And what horse got you into racing at the same time? Oh, I do remember uh, getting off school to watch uh, Don run win the Gold Cup. Oh, that was wow. good. Wow. Uh, I remember another time where um, I was, uh, we had PE, you know, physical education, I'm sure it's the same PE in England, sure. and uh, um, the Gold Cup was on, so I feigned injury, and to listen to the, the Gold Cup, uh, it was the one the Carvels Hill and Desert Orchid, 
uh, and Yahoo were in. And uh, the next thing, uh, I'm sitting on the side of the pitch while they're all having a game of football. And uh, the, the PE teacher says to me, uh, Gavin, will you referee the game? Because I want to win, go in and watch the Gold Cup. <laughs> so I ended up refereeing a football match, but I was looking at the ground and I gave a penalty that I didn't even see, etc. So that was that was good. A favourite horse back in the day, it used to be Carmel's Hill before some of the more famous horses came along. I thought he was amazing. Uh, and then obviously you have Cato Star and stuff. Um, but yeah, back in the day, it would have been Carmel Hill. I thought he was an amazing race horse. What was um? What's your favorite Gold Cup winner as as well? Uh, outside outside of that, in the more more recent years, of course, we've we've seen Best Mate, Corto Star, and it's really hard to compare them. But who who's the one, Gav? I I always find Kicking Kings a real underrated Gold Cup winner. I've got a really nice book about Kicking King here for Tom Taff. I've always liked him just to chuck a name into into the mix. Yeah. But what sort of Gold Cup uh, horse really sort of got you going, Gav? I actually uh, was standing at the last fence when Kicking King won his Gold Cup, so wow. that was. Yeah. It's a great, it's a brilliant place to stand, by the way, because they jump past you three times. So, of course, so of course, it's, it's good. Uh, favorite Gold Cup winner, apart from Don Run, I suppose really Kato Star uh, regaining his title from Denman the following year. I thought that was amazing. Uh, to you know to win one five King Georges etc. and two Gold Cup three was a phenomenal horse, wasn't he? And two Tingle Creeks. I could so. say the Tingle Creeks as well. I mean, they weren't the best Tingle Creeks, but he still won them and beat what was there. So we can't. Can't take them off them, can we? But for, for no, and I, I watched um I watched uh, the Ruby Walsh interview there with Racing TV uh, yesterday and today, yeah. and uh, Ruby's memory for the details is fun. it's worth watching just for that. I did. Like I, people I, say he was an amazing jockey, but I'd say one of the reasons why he was amazing was just his intelligence level. Uh, definitely helped him. Could listen to Ruby talk about horses all day as well. It's just his passion for it. Really, I watched it last night on Racing TV. It really did give me goosebumps when he was talking about Hurricane Fly and stuff. It's just unbelievable. But even did you see the way Joe that he described? I thought this was one of the most amazing bits. It's where he described how Hurricane Fly jumped a hurdle. Right yeah. now, Hurricane Fly wasn't a big horse, so he was a small horse. Uh, but I always felt that Hurricane Fly knew he was in a horse race because he just wanted to win. But the way he described that uh, with Hurricane Fly, his two shoulders came up and then down again. Yeah, sure. And he actually watched Simple. Hurricane Fly jump in a hurdle. It's actually brilliantly described because that's what it he just, did. It just looks makes it look so simple, but it meant every single time he was so slick over all the obstacles as well. It was just amazing. It really was amazing to watch. We're very, very fortunate um, to have such good stars in our sport. Of course, he won 22 grade ones, I believe he, he won as well. He did, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're I, that's a world record, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. we'd be lucky, with all due respect, to see Constitution Hill run 22 times in his career, to be honest, the way things are going at the moment. So, you know, for a horse to be that continuously at the top level, when so many, yeah. just clear by the rest, was absolutely brilliant, brilliant stuff. Jamie, have you got anything you'd like to, to chuck at Gav at all? I suppose you know what I'm going to probably ask you, Gav. You give us late, late the last day. Thank you for that. Uh, a handicapper to follow. <laughs> uh, I backed I backed that... Um, and I'll end on Saturday. Um, I was disappointed, I suppose. It was a bit, a bit too far for him. And would you see him going forward, obviously, to win a big handicap? But anything uh, bar him? Anything bar uh, him, I suppose. Yeah. Can I'll end um, was a massive eye catcher last year. Then he wins a main hurdle over two and a half. He reappears in Galway and was a huge, a huge eye catcher. Yeah. Without favourite the other day. But he was running over three miles and one. Now, he did oh. stay the trip. Like, he just kind of ran into one, I'd say. But certainly, I, he'll win one of his next three handicaps, you'd feel. Uh, he's just probably a bit inexperienced more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But that was a huge step up and trip to three miles one. I think if he gets reasonable ground, two miles six, two and a half, I don't see why he wouldn't win again. Um, you're going to ask about a handicap, are you? Yeah. <laughs> I see a lot of people, um, I saw Johnny Deneen put up um, Panda Boy for an Ultima. Is that a yeah. he's brazzled as well, isn't he? Is he brazzled as well? Yeah. Ah, yeah, no, it's is he too much of, he, he's too much of a wise guy's horse now, I think, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I happen, I happen, you can't go near anything for a handicap yet. Uh, first of all, I think there's only one bookmaker betting on some of them, so that's that's the first bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, I, I think we're guilty of getting excited, aren't we, as well? We just want to try and yeah. find the plot job yeah. so we can say in March, oh, I mentioned this in October, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> Sure like Jody Ted it. would have a chance of her attempts. I wouldn't mm. back him at the moment. Mm. Uh, he won off 114 of attempts qualifier. Now, obviously, the old rule is you shouldn't win a qualifier because it's bad luck. Uh, he won that off 114. He's gone up 12 pounds to 126. He'll probably go in the Paddy Power Handicap Chase at Christmas next, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, if he went for attempts, 
126 will turn into 131, which nowadays might just get you in at the bottom. He'd have a bit of a squeak, but like, would I back him? Probably not. But just to mention one, you know, but he'd have a little bit of a chance, but nothing jumping off the page on handicaps yet. Definitely not. You said something interesting on Twitter today, Gab, about with the Gordon Elliott thing potentially only having four runners now, trainers and racers, and the state man rule. So I think it's quite an overplayed thing sometimes. People think everything's plotted to win these handicaps. But then in recent years, you've got the likes of Sean Bard, who won a Kim, your Vintage Cloud, who won an Ultima, Global Citizen, who won a Grand Annual. They've all been there and done it. There's just horses that sometimes are so obvious and have ran so many times. People just forget that as well, I think. I think that uh, you can make two totally different uh, plans in terms of handicap chasers need lots of experience. So you're yeah. going to get, you could get a 10 year old like Global Citizen winning the Grand Annual and he ran it well and again, I think this year. Uh, whereas with the, the hurdlers, it's better to have um, less runs. Yeah, more unexposed. Yeah, like the Martin Pipe has turned in. You might as well call it the novice handicap hurdle for <laughs> yeah. conditional jockeys <laughs> or whatever. But So I think in terms of hurdlers, it's, it's good to have. Uh, the right profile like that Caldwell Potter he's had two runs could he end up Gordon said he's not going to overpay him this season uh, so it doesn't sound like he's going for grade ones something like him Gordon will have you oh, know every year we talk about 10 Gordon horses for the Martin Pike but uh, I, I think for the hurdlers do you? Yeah he, he's a full um, bro- he's a full brother to Mighty Potter as well Caldwell he's and, a and a half a brother to Brighter Days Ahead that's a right half bro- to, to the mayor yeah mm, mm. but um the handicap chases, I think it's it's very difficult to have a plot job for a handicap chase, unless maybe the Kim Muir is one, mm-hmm. but the rest of the race is probably not. And then Coral Cup, you need tons of experience, but the Martin Pipe, not so much. And the County Hurdle, you can probably get away with a novice that did a reasonable record in that race. So I think hurdlers, yeah, look for a plot job, but the handicap chasers, no. You need, a, you need a bit of toughness, don't you? A bit of a hardy sort, especially when you yeah. want to win, if you want I, to win something like the Ultima or something. You need a real... You're not going to win it with like Nassalam last year, but say like this year after he won um, whatever he won at the weekend, he'd be a sort for that now that he's sort of a bit more physically able, I'd say. I feel like that's quite a big part to look at as well with these these chasers. Gav, one thing actually I'd like to ask you, um, I won't keep you too much longer, um, right. is what I talk, I talk to these guys quite a lot about physicality when it comes to the mayor. So for example... This year, we've got Ashro Diamond, we've got Love Envoy, we've got a lot of older horses due to line up in the Mare's Hurdle. Yet we've got mm. some younger horses like Lottie Mouth and Gala Marceau, still physically quite small, whilst having to step up in trip. Would that be something that ever goes into your thought process at all? Because for me, like right now, Ashro Diamond is the one that's way ahead of schedule, where Lossy Mouth hasn't even proved she can stay the trip yet. And she's still very young and raw. Do you, do you feel like we're guilty sometimes of just looking what won last year, expecting it to win the following year as well? Is physicality something that ever comes into play? Um, uh, physicality, you know, physicality, yes and no. Like you see Quivega, who is very small. You've probably can fly them, very small. You've got some massive horses. We all think that they're going to 17 hands are going to be better chasers. They don't always work out that way. Uh, I think that's, Obviously, the, the staff that everybody knows about four year olds turning five, that's against Lazy Mouth. The only thing is that Zarek the Brave, who she beat well, went and won the Galway hurdle. So that's kind of irking at me. I wasn't going to, I haven't backed anything to the mayor's hurdle yet, but I was against the idea of them, you know, four year olds turning five. Uh, but the flip side of that is Zarek the Brave winning a Galway. Also, Willie has said that he's going to be patient with Lazy Mouth and Gallimar. So he's not going okay. to run them, run them yet. They're going to okay. reappear after Christmas. Like, that's probably a that's how clever Willie is. Um, yes, He'd done the so same with Volban. He was very patient with him. Um, the Mayor's Hurdle is is a race that I like looking at because you know that they're going for that race. Yes. So it's, you know, there's no guesswork uh, about what's going to show up. Uh, I thought that Love Envoy and you were well were disappointing. I know that the ground was terrible in Sandown on Saturday. I was expecting more from Love Envoy, to be honest. Um, having been second in the race last year. But... Mm. Yeah, I think the mayor's race is very interesting, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure which way to fade it now. Would Would you? This is slightly controversial. Would you? Are you happy with the mayor's uh, programs, or would you scrap that to make the champion hurdle, the champion chase, and things like that more competitive again in the uh, in the future, Gav? Uh, I think it's fine. I wouldn't change it uh, for people that complain about mayor's hurdles, like. First thing you'd say is there's a 1,000 guineas and a 2,000 guineas, and there's never a word about that. Um, secondly, is that 
you're getting like in the last 10 years, the only two mayors that I can think of off the top of my head that could compete in a champion order was obviously Annie Power and um and Honey. Honey Suckle. Honey. Yeah, um, absolutely. But uh, you know, it's very, very, very rare for that to happen. I, I don't have an issue with the mayor's races. Uh, the mayor's chase is fine. That's starting to develop its own culture and history. Uh, the mayor's novice hurdle, I think, is a fine addition. It's actually it's better for punters that there are mayor's races. Yes, absolutely. It separates things a little bit, but also you know that they're going for that race and there's less guesswork. So I like them. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I agree. I definitely like them as well. It's more just a speculative sort of question, really, just to see if um had any sort of alternate views. Um, Scotty, James, anything else to, to chuck at Gav before before we wrap it up? Just one quick question, if Gavin doesn't mind me asking. Um, no, it's thanks, not, not totally related to horses you like, but for more from a professional punter or any kind of punting aspect. Say if you personally are having, if you don't mind me asking, a bad day. Um, I've been a victim in the past of kind of letting my emotions overtake and sometimes I'll try and chase or go on a bit of a downswing and try and get it all back in one go. What do you do um, to not let it affect you? And is there anything that you do to kind of think today's enough and there's always another day? Is there anything you do to kind of say to yourself, stop and regroup kind of thing? <laughs> uh, when you're doing it as long as I've been doing it uh, Scott you, you know I was impetuous in my 20s and I'd be chasing and back and you know things in all weather and all that rubbish but I mean eventually you stop that but it takes years probably to stop doing such thing um, if I'm on a bad run the next day I'll actually bet smaller to be honest mm -hmm. rather than bigger um, I wouldn't really chase now if, if I fancy three horses and this is not I don't think this is chasing right but if I fancy three horses of a day and you do a multiple and uh, the first two get beat, I'll then have more on the third horse because I think that's justified. But if the first one wins, if the second one wins, well, then you don't have to back the third one. But if they do get beat, well, then you do. But uh, in terms of chasing, you just have to keep a profit and loss and just be boring about it. You can't be, you know, uh, Johnny Big Balls and you know, uh, have a big bet in the last race to get out. And then even if the horse does win and you do get out, it's it's not really, you're kind of cheating. You shouldn't be doing it. So I don't know. I think um, it's just day to day. If, if you back in four races, you know, tomorrow and you're betting in four races, it's just four races of 25 or 30 that you bet in a week. Do you know what I mean? It's not, one day runs into the next. So I think, um, yeah, you can't chase losses. Uh, I but it probably just takes years of of doing it before you you stop doing those sort of things, you know. You definitely got to make the mistakes, haven't you, to to learn from them in this sport. Um, like you said, if you if you if you've had one bet, one loser, just got to say right, it's fine. I'll, I'm sure I make it up as the week goes on, and you know, stay afloat. I suppose you don't want it to double backfire, and then you've got a big hole in your pocket, you know, and all all of that. But like you said, always wise, Gav. I think isn't it the profit and loss is always a detrimental part of punting. You're you're be able to obviously, I guess, find out what your what your capabilities are, how much you're willing to then be able to put into the sport as far as punting goes. I suppose there's a lot lot to weigh up, but like you said, Gav, all the experience and time obviously will will be beneficial in in that department for for sure. Right then, Gav, thank you very very much for joining us. We really do appreciate you taking out your time to be here. Um, Thanks, Joe. We'll have to have a game of golf next year. Yeah, absolutely. When I when I come over to your side of the water, or you pop over, we'll definitely get that sorted out for sure. I really, really. When you like come to the DRF, give me a shout, and we'll uh, we'll meet up with the DRF. Yeah, definitely. Sounds great, Gal. Thanks very much for that. We'll be actually overstaying with Scotty and uh, Jamie as well. So we we be great to great to meet up with you. Absolutely. Right, guys. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you can find Gav, of course, all over Twitter, and you can of course find him at GavinLynchRacing.com, where you can sign up to Gav's um service. Very much worth going to check out Gav. Does some fantastic stuff. Superb for our sport. We really do appreciate everything he does and, of course, his time today. If you are new to my channel, thanks for tuning in. Please do subscribe. It does help me out a great deal. I really do appreciate you tuning in. Hopefully, you'll be back for the next episode as well. Jamie, Scotty, Gav, thank you very much, and we'll see you all real soon.